Hey, welcome everybody to the Aliosha Society. We're pursuing truth and beauty and goodness, and we're still doing it through great literature. We're watching now, you're watching now, video number two out of seven total. Two out of seven total on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. No, I know. I already, I already said this in the previous video. Mr. Edder, seven videos on a little teeny poem that could literally fit on two pages? Yeah. Remember what I told you? Most people that just pick up this poem and look at it end up looking something. I don't know what even happened to this guy. See, his hands even got bent up. Either looking like that guy or, or no, no, no. Here's this is. But here's the good news. Eventually, you'll look like this. You just kind of turn greenish and yellowish, kind of a Medusa effect. Now, for some people, it's more like the, you know, sticking the finger in the light socket kind of thing. So, but hey, listen, here's the good news. By the time we finish the wasteland, you'll definitely look like this. Um, okay, no, seriously. Let, 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 it's just a very complicated, uh, deep poem. You'll see that. I'm not sure that anybody really understands everything in the wasteland. Yeah, believe it or not, it's actually that complicated. Okay, so here we are. We already did video number one. We did the generic poetry video, you know, Hebrew poetry, the sonnet. We did all that. In this video, we're going to be looking at, actually, it's more than just T.S. Eliot. It's the historical context. The poem was published in 1922. So you know what we need to do. We're doing the historical biographical approach. So we want to find out, well, what was happening in the world around that time and who in the world was T.S. Eliot and yes back to my blah grayish brownish wasteland shirt yeah I'll have this one on for all seven videos yep you got it let's uh begin with some reminders you should have watched a video a while back called keys to understand a book and Specifically, we'll be looking at, you know, when you look at poetry, it's the same literary toolbox. It's just that all of the elements of the toolbox may or may not apply. Like, for example, elements of a plot. They're not really going to, there's not really a plot in the wasteland. But the ones that do apply, we're going to pull the tools out of the literary toolbox and look at them. We are, uh, the historical biographical approach says when you're reading any book, I don't care what it is essay, novel, poem, scripture even. Who's the author? What can you learn about him or her? Why did he or she write this book or poem or whatever? To whom were they writing and when did it all happen? Now that could be when did the author write it and if the time period that the author's writing about is different, we got to learn about that too. But what's the genre? So we talked about the different kinds of poem, and obviously, you know, guys, this is not obviously a sonnet or terzarima or Hebrew poetry or epic poetry. Well, it kind of, okay, I'm going to make a case that it's a little bit somewhat like epic poetry later, but just hang on. This is, this is modernist poetry at its most probably important and influential. This is the quintessential modernist poetry poem, The Wasteland. You may have already known that. What does that mean? Well, that's that's what we're going to be doing. Once again, I just want to whip through the literary toolbox. The ones in red are the ones that we're going to do in this video. So no elements of a plot, really. We did, we did genre in the previous video. We're going to do the historical biographical context in this one. So let's get right to it. Who was this guy? Well, first of all, probably good to know what T and S stand for. <laughs> Thomas Stearns. What do we know about Thomas Stearns Eliot? You know, it's interesting. Uh, he he did end up living in England for uh, uh, well, actually by the 1920s and on. He was he was living. He ended up getting a, a British citizenship, but he was he was an American. He was born in St. Louis. In 1888, now I put after Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, because sometimes I teach Virginia Woolf and James Joyce alongside Eliot. They're, they're all 
kind of mixed up, you know, being very influential in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So I just happened to put that up there. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, I, I would say T.S. Eliot is, you know, when I think of the smartest individuals, at least that I know about, who've lived in history, I think of people like Homer, you know, I think of Theodore Roosevelt, That he was just such an impressive guy. Uh, I think of James Joyce, but I, you know, T.S. Eliot may have been one of the most well-read, insanely intelligent, just like intelligent to the point where, you know, common people like myself just can't even really get our brains around it. But he graduates from Harvard in 1910. He knows multiple languages. His grasp of history and the humanities in general is astounding. He immediately goes and spends, uh, He's remember, he's about 28, 29 at this point. He spends uh, a year abroad, spends some time in England, and, and he was kind of hooked. He really wanted to kind of be British. Uh, he meets Ezra Pound. The Wasteland is actually dedicated to the poet Ezra Pound. I don't know if we're going to get a whole lot of time to talk about Ezra Pound, but if you want to look him up, uh, he's an important figure in T.S. Eliot's life. Now, Ooh, where's the wasteland fit in? 1922. Yeah. So 1922 is, he wrote it in 1921. It's published in 22. Hmm. Now I just want you to kind of get the wheels turning and I want you to start thinking what was going on in the world. That's significant, especially Europe and the United States. What, what, what had just happened? What was getting ready to happen? When he wrote the wasteland, I, my best guess, if I had to make a judgment call, is that T.S. Eliot was not a Christian when he wrote The Wasteland. But interestingly, five years later, he was very secretive about it. Yeah, he it, it sort of got baptized, kind of like behind closed doors and so forth. But, but anyway, it is what it is. He actually joins the Church of England in 1927. And I think we have every reason to believe that he embraced the Christian faith. Now, that's interesting because if you'll take a look at this, so he, you know, for 40 years, he's just cranking out, you know, thoughtful, 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 uh, you know, works of literature, mostly poetry. But in 1945, he published a, a similarly difficult, profoundly beautiful uh, poems called the the four quartets, which kind of sort of seems to be sort of like the Christian response to the very deeply troubling and pessimistic worldview in the wasteland. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I wish we had time to do both, but uh, that's that's how it all fleshes out. He uh, gets married in 1957 to Valerie Fletcher. Yeah, do the math on that. I mean, what is he, 69 years old at that point? And he dies uh, eight years later. And I, you know, again, I just barely missed him. Well, I was born in 1969, so I was negative four when T.S. Eliot died. So there it is. Now, that's that's just a big, you know, generic skeleton outline. Friends, I'm just giving you the tools here. That's what this course is all about. See, if you're if you're really going to dig into a poem like The Wasteland, then you would read at least a really good, solid biography of T.S. Eliot, maybe two or three. I'm saying if you're really going to dig in, you know, and you do a lot more historical research, I'm just kind of, you know, boop, just throwing out these little tidbits and showing you, hey, this is kind of how we do it. So there you have it. Now, I want to get let's turn now to historical context. Oh, this is going to look familiar to some of you, isn't it? I cannot figure out where to put I'm going to go way down bottom left here. Oh, this is going to look familiar to some of you. Yeah. How did Western man sojourn from medieval to modern? This is sort of like the big picture of, you know, how did we, how did medieval man, you know, who was really, you know, in the, in, in the medieval time period, Western man was 
basically Christian. It was a Christian culture. It doesn't mean every single individual is a Christian, but the culture was very baptized, you might say. But it's not today. So I'm always I'm always interested in showing students, you need to be able to explain how did that transition take place? Well, I picture worldviews like a car. You get in a car and it goes somewhere. Well, a worldview goes somewhere, okay? It, it will take you somewhere. It, it ends up at a particular destination and you need to be able to look forward and see what that is. So you get in your worldview car and you're, you're, you know, you're medieval, Christianized, baptized, got the fish on the back of the car, got the K-Love on the radio, you know, little Tim Hawkins, you just Chick-fil-A. I mean, you got the whole Christian mindset, but then you go through this tunnel. And when you go through this tunnel, you hit three speed bumps. And when your car comes out the other side of the tunnel, it's, uh, it doesn't look the same. Yeah, it's not really the same. Anyway. So the three speed bumps are Renaissance, Reformation, and Enlightenment. Now, some of you knew those because you've had me in class before, but let's just quickly look at them. Renaissance, late medieval time period. It's a rebirth of Greco-Roman art, literature, philosophy. This Christianized, baptized medieval man starts thinking, hmm, maybe we shouldn't just like toss the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe we kind of need to have a revival of studying thinkers like Plato and Aristotle and, 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 and all the ancients, Ovid and Cicero and Virgil and Homer. And so there's this renewal and that in itself is not bad. I mean, my courses, that's, that's what I do. That's what I teach. But what that does is it, is it, is it introduces this pagan uh, philosophy and worldview that kind of ends up meshing in a little bit with this very Christian perspective. And the two kind of get sort of all uh, blended up together. Now, the second speed bump we hit is the Reformation. Reformation, we're, we're Protestants. Now, some of you watching this video may be Roman Catholic. That's great. Uh, but for the most part, we look at the Reformation and we say, hey, the Reformation's good, you know, a focus on reading scripture in your own language, you know, priesthood of the believers, and, and so forth. Here's the thing. I'm not saying the Reformation's bad. What I'm saying is, is that the Reformation encouraged a mindset that promoted individualism. That is, I can discover truth on my own. I don't need a priest. I don't need a pope. I don't, I, you know, so that is, is one of those things where if you don't keep it in balance, the pendulum swings. And that's exactly what ends up happening. So now you've got a, a, an emphasis on pagan philosophy, an emphasis on individualism, which is not biblical at all. And then sort of the knockout punch is an 18th century movement we call the Enlightenment. Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. Some of the founding fathers, others, Voltaire. So, you know, I'm just trying to name some names here. Montesquieu, David Hume. These are thinkers who at this time period said, you know what? We don't need God or the Bible or angels or demons to explain what's going on in the world. We can do it with science. We can do it with logic. We can do it with capital R, reason. And so the Enlightenment is kind of like the knockout blow. The Renaissance kind of sets the stage. Reformation, individualism, I can figure it out on my own. And the Enlightenment is bam. So when the, when the worldview car goes through these three speed, speed bumps in the tunnel, when it comes out the other side, it's not medieval man anymore. We get into the, you know, AD 1500, 1600, these are morphing over hundreds of years, guys. These things don't happen overnight. But basically, we have what we call modern man, which is going to last to the late 19th century. Now, wait a second. This is, is this modern? Hmm. Well, yes, it, this is modernist 
poetry, and I do want to make a distinction, if not now, then later, between modern and postmodern. So keep that in mind. Just, just store that away for now. So there you have it, a review. There's the statue of David, of Michelangelo's David, the representative of the Renaissance. There's Martin Luther, representative of the Reformation. And I think that's Voltaire, representative of the Enlightenment, the three speed bumps. Now, we're trying to get up to here. Okay, we're trying to get up to 1922. So, big question at the bottom. What comes after the Enlightenment? Because the Enlightenment is, it's not that we don't think that way now. We're, we're still kind of in an Enlightenment. But it kind of fades and morphs into something else in the 19th century. It is the 1800s. So we're, we're not even close to 1922 yet. Ah, some of you know. Some of you know. It's romanticism. Yeah, so we have Enlightenment, 18th century, romanticism, 19th century. Now, what is romanticism? Is this all about Romeo and Juliet? No, not a whole lot to do with, not that kind of romantic. Okay, let me let me explain to you what romanticism is as a worldview, as a, as a way of thinking about all of reality. All right, so here's what's happening in the 19th century. Mankind is basically, as my mom used to say, is getting a little too big for his britches. Okay, he's getting full of himself. Why? Because look at all these cool inventions. Now, I know, I know you don't think the typewriter is a cool invention. But guys, when it, when, the, when it first came out, it was cool. I know what some of you are thinking, ooh, the cotton gin. But guys, it just revolutionized agriculture. So then you've got uh, the telephone, telegraph, you've got the steamboat, you know, you've got the light bulb. So during this time that that Western man is coming up with all, I mean, there were, there were, uh, there was progress in education, medicine, science, mathematics, in every area, there's just like this explosion. Well, how do you think mankind is going to think about himself with all these amazing inventions man we are pretty amazing and then he invents toilet paper i mean you thought that you know western man was getting prideful with all those other things guys toilet paper did you hear what 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 about toilet paper are you not understanding okay sorry just being a little bit funky and fun and weird but Again, wow. I mean, I, I don't even want to talk about what people might have used before the invention. of. We're not going to talk about that. No, not even in the Monday night class. So let's talk a little bit about what impact this 19th century progress would have had. Quickly, industrial revolution. We have factories being built. We have mass production of products, uh, machines that are now building things instead of, you know, a, a blacksmith or a cobbler. Or I mean, it's, you know, and mankind's thinking, wow, uh, advances in education, literacy rates are going up. More people are learning how to read and, and politics. Uh, we have this old uh, medieval feudal system you probably studied that, you know, knights and lords and that kind of thing, which is morphing into nation states and democratic republics. And so even in politics, we're getting better. Uh, I already mentioned science and technology. Wow. Guys, I can't stress enough the wow. You really got to get that or everything I'm talking about in all seven of these videos, they're not going to make sense. You got it? You get it? 19th century? Wow. Mankind is amazing. And just a, just a real quick summary, one way you could look at romanticism. Romanticism is a pendulum swing against the Enlightenment says thinking, logic, reason, 
science, romanticism still believes all that, but it says, oh, but what about my feelings? My feelings, they matter. And so you've got Lord Byron, you've got the poets, and you've got transcendentalism, you know, so you got this em emphasis on emotion. But here's what, to, here's what I really want you to get, and I want you to memorize this. The mantra of romanticism is this. Man is basically good, and his progress is inevitable. In other words, man is not sinful, like the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2 and so forth. No, 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 no. He's not inherently sinful. He's basically good. His environment might kind of make him do bad things. But not only is man good, he's only getting better. Well, think about it. Why wouldn't 19th century man think this? Toilet paper! What did you not understand about toilet paper? All these inventions and all these advances. Really, really, really trying hard here, guys, to make sure you get the point of romanticism. It was a time of unbridled optimism and hope and confidence in mankind. Oh, we're so amazing. Now, when we come to the 20th century, you know, you know that is not the way people thought in the 20th. Everybody turns emo in the 20th century. You know, everyone's like, you know, moping around. We have absurdism. We have, you know, nihilism. We have all these like dark, you know, you know, uh, pessimistic philosophies. Whoa, what happened to the puppies and unicorns and rainbows? I'll show you what happened. World War One. World War One happened. And like a, no, not a sledgehammer, like a wrecking ball, it smashes the romantic, oh, we're so amazing. Are we really? Are we really that amazing? Okay, let's, let's just talk about how amazing we may or may not be. Let's look at what happened. Now, again, if you don't remember the dates, for World War I, it's 1914 to 1918. So it's right at the beginning of the 20th century. Why? Why did World War I become the wet blanket that just smothered all of that puppies and unicorns and rainbows? Basically, what was going on in World War I is what we call trench warfare. That's where a bunch of guys dig a hole in the ground, a long, 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 you know, like snake-shaped hole. And they burrow down in it, and they peek up, shoot at the enemy. They peek up, they launch their, you know, whatever, grenades. And the two sides basically just slaughter each other. It's just a slaughter fest. Oh, look at that. 20,000 men just died because we're just out here on the field just lobbing, you know, bullets and grenades at each other. Oh, hey, get another 20,000 guys out here. Let's get a new they die. They die. They're replaced. 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 I, I could say that 50 more times and it still wouldn't have the impact that it should have about how horrific. And yeah, I put those images up on the board and there you get, you know, get the children away. But I'm telling you guys, World War I might be the closest thing to hell on earth that mankind has experienced. It was indescribably horrific. And we use the words slaughter and attrition. I think you know what slaughter means. Attrition just means this. If we started with this many soldiers, here's what's happening every day for four years. We're just decreasing the population because we're just killing off one another. Um, man's inhumanity to man. We just, so wait a second. We were so amazing and we were advancing and we were skipping and holding hands and the sunshine was always out. But now mankind, we're treating each other like animals, like barbarians. What in the world happened? Now watch this, watch this. 40 million casualties. Now watch this. 17 million people. 
there's no way that you could get your brain around that, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try to help you grasp what that means. Friends, that is almost 12,000 deaths every single day for four years. And for what? 10 yards of mud, a mile of mud. What was it all really for? It wasn't like the wars in the past that were, you know, the Revolutionary War. We're fighting for our freedoms. And, you know, the American Civil War, there, there were real sort of issues of nobility and morality involved. Not World War I. No, no. And not even like World War II. At least, you know, we were, we were trying to stop the Nazis. Not World War I. Now, this is going to be very disturbing to some of you, especially, and I know that if you're a student watching this video, you did not live through World, I'm um, sorry, you did not live through 9-11. Because even as of the making of this video, it was 22 years ago. I lived through 9-11. I was at work when the planes hit the two uh, towers. I was about an hour away from the Pentagon and I got the news. And it was it was uh, a troubling, troubling, troubling day. And for years, our nation is still not over it. But just to put this in a perspective, what do you guys think it would be like if we had another 9-11? You know, we lost over 3,000 lives on 9-11. And that field in Pennsylvania in the at the Pentagon and at the two towers, the twin towers in New York City. What do you think it would be like? Well, I'm not done. What do you think it would be like? I know this is horrible to even think of it. If we had four 9-11s in one day, four of them, Okay, it's 22 years after 9-11 right now, and our nation is still wounded from it. People still, it, 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 it forever changed us. But what if we had four in one day? Oh, this is where it gets creepy. How about, what would happen if we went two weeks or two days even and had four 9-11s every day for two days or a week or two weeks. I think you guys know where I'm headed with this. What if we had four 9-11s every day for four years? 12,000 deaths a day, guys. Now, I realize that those deaths were spread out over multiple nations. I realize this is not an apples to apples comparison in that way. But as far as the number of deaths... Four 9-11s every day, unending, nonstop, from 1914, 1915, 1916, 1917, and it finally ends in 1918. Yeah. So I'm trying to get you some perspective that's going to help you understand, first of all, why is this called the wasteland? And what is going on? So what was the culture thinking about? Okay, so here's our quick recap. I want you to see the timeline in different ways because it will relate to different ones of you in different ways. So medieval era, way on the left here, Renaissance, Reformation, we already talked about that, 1500s, 30, the Enlightenment is 18th century, which is 1700s. Oh, yes. What's the mantra of Romanticism? Come on, pause the video right now and say it to yourself. Is that a good fake pause? I practice that. Man is basically good and his progress is inevitable. Man is basically good and his progress is inevitable. Wow, look at how amazing we are. You see, my line is going up there because, wow, this is a time of tremendous optimism and hope. But the line doesn't gradually come down. It comes down straight down. 
vertical, Com perfectly vertical. What did I say? Killed romanticism. World War One. Four 9-11s every day for four years. That'll do it. For what? Nothing. Trench warfare, fair, slaughter, attrition. And then look at this. Now look at this, guys, because this is where I'm leading. In that context, just a few years, while the Western world is still like, whoa, what in the world just happened? What happened to our romances? Just a couple of years after that, T.S. Eliot sits down and he tries to express in some way what the psyche of the, of the Western world was experiencing in the wasteland. That's that's what he's trying, that's what he's trying to, to land here. So romanticism kills romance. Uh, sorry, World War I kills romanticism. How can Western man think, oh, we're basically good and we're just getting better? No. How can Western man think that? after the horrors and the inhumanity and the barbarity of World War I. Nothing, nothing, nothing noble about it. There's your wrecking ball. That wrecking ball is World War I. That brick wall was romanticism. A really cool quote here from William Golding I want to share with you. He said, before the Second World War, uh, well, he's he's applying this to the Second World War. I think it, the same concept. Before the Second World War, I believed in the perfectibility of social man. But after the war, I did not. I discovered what one man could do to one another. Anyone who moved through those years without understanding that man produces evil as a bee produces honey must have been blind or wrong in the head. Man produces evil as a bee produces honey. Was anybody really screaming that from the mountaintops in the 19th century? No. No, it's it. Uh, what did you not get about toilet paper? I mean, come on, guys. All, all these advances. No, no, nobody was, nobody was singing that tune. Now, what happens as a result of World War I to Western man? Look at those images on the right. That one on the bottom. I've used this image, you know, in teaching this course for years and years. And every time I see it, it just something, something just dies in my soul when I see that. That picture seems to really capture. But let's take a look at these philosophical results. First of all, nihilism was widely embraced and then leads to existentialism. We'll talk about existentialism later. Nihilism is the belief that there's no God. There's nothing other than what you see. There's no hope. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. There's really actually no reason to get out of bed. If you want to get out of bed and you want to make up a reason, you want to fool yourself into believing that there's purpose and meaning in life, then make up something and voila, you just became an existentialist. A nihilist would just kind of hang on to, there's no reason, no purpose, and a nihilist might actually be consistent with his worldview and commit suicide. Uh, Albert Camus, the great absurdist of the 20th century, that's exactly what he said. That's kind of the logical end. But if you want to authenticate yourself and you want to kind of keep on living for, you know, make up a reason and, uh, and that's existentialism. It was the final nail in the coffin of this idealistic romanticism. I've already kind of hopefully emphasized that. Uh, World War I brought about the end of what you might call objectivism. That is, that there is um, objectivism, that there is truth apart from what I think or feel. It's out there. It's apart from me. And I can either believe it or not believe it. But my believing it or not believing it doesn't change the fact that here's this thing called truth. That's objectivism. What ends up happening after World War I is World War I just blows everyone's minds and souls and psyches and they start thinking 
maybe there is actually no such thing as truth. Like, how could there even be a God, for example, who would allow that to happen? So is the seeds of what we call postmodernism or relativism. Yeah, look at that bottom picture. That bottom picture, I, I think, said that if you want to know what the 20, what 20th century philosophy and literature is like, there it is. There it is. Enter T.S. Eliot, who writes this poem in this context. It, it, again, you see why I'm doing all this introduction? The, the poem wouldn't make any sense if we just opened the book and started you know, reading line one. You have to have all of this background and this conversation and these events that have been happening before 1922. Yeah, I know. We're not even done yet. Now I, I need to do an entire video just introducing the poem itself. So we've done an introduction to poetry. Now we've done an introduction to Eliot and, you know, the historical backdrop, Enlightenment, Romanticism, World War I, man is basically good, his progress is inevitable. World War I is the wrecking ball that smashes that. T.S. Eliot writes this poem in this context. Here's the overview. Thanks for hanging out, friends. Next video, we will do the introduction to the poem. Once again, well, hang on a second. I'm trying to get myself set. Once again, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you in the next video, guys.